Welcome to Design Talk 22. This design talk is about finding drawings, models, and products to help with learning and practicing CAD. Pictured here is a shell and tube oil cooler, quite often called a heat exchanger. It will be the base model that discussions will revolve around in this presentation. Over the years I've had many questions about how I go about finding models or drawings from which to practice my CAD skills. Over the last year in particular, since joining Reddit, I have also seen this question posted time and again. As such, I thought we'd take this opportunity to address this topic more fully as we move forward through this presentation. I began to learn TurboCAD in 2002. Although TurboCAD had been around since 1983, there was little in the way of learning aids even by the time I began to use it. The producers did, however, supply a small tutorial booklet with the version I had purchased. It seemed to be a good little introduction at the time, but I just ran through it for this presentation and found it to be needlessly complex, and of course really light on detailed steps. The 2D camera was simple enough and offered a glimpse into working with 2D tools, and the 3D lawnmower, again very simple, introduced a few of the 3D tools. As good as tutorials may be at providing a foot up on the learning curve, and trust me when I say that not all tutorials are created equally, nothing helps more than finding a real-world item around the house and modeling it one piece at a time. To help with this process, I encourage users to purchase a set of calipers. Grab a non-digital set if you want to learn that on top of it. My first set was non-digital, but I bought a digital set when I wanted to measure and model the original calipers. I've had a couple of digital calipers over the years, but my last set by Origin Cal I have liked the best. The digits don't jump all over the place like some of the cheaper ones do. The first real-world item I dismantled, measured, and modeled was the Maphead compass seen here on the right. I don't have that compass any longer, but I found an image of something similar on the internet. Mine was boxier, more like the one seen in the inset on the left, so perhaps it was even an earlier incarnation of the product. I can tell by reviewing my old model that my skill level was in its infancy, but I did manage all the parts. Just as a side note, I remodeled the compass in the latest version of TurboCAD while preparing this design talk. I used the old model as a guide so it was easy to get dimensions and whatnot to help me work it out. I did note that I would have approached some of the parts a bit differently now that I have 20 years experience under my belt. Pictured here is the new model rendered anew in Keyshot. Continuing in a similar vein, I encourage users to visit local stores and purchase products that can be taken apart and try to model them for experience sake. Aside from the experience of modeling the parts, one can gain some insight into product design, product development, and manufacturing. These are things that are often part of a CAD user's career path anyway. Be sure to check out my design talk number 10 about reverse engineering for an in-depth look at this Home Depot work light. Be sure to check out your kids' or grandkids' toy boxes too. You'd be surprised what you can find in there that might spark your interest. This Barbie suitcase was one such thing I found in amongst my granddaughter's things. It seemed somewhat complex for such a small thing, but I found it interesting enough to make me want to model it. Something like this is probably not the kind of thing you want to start with on your learning curve, but certainly down the road when you're looking to enhance those skills. I actually modeled the Barbie suitcase twice, once in SolidWorks and once in TurboCAD to see how modeling would differ. There were definite differences when it came to the modeling procedures, but doable in both cases. Be sure to check out my design talk number 12 for a closer look at this project. Finding current real-world product drawings is almost unheard of. This is due to the fact that most drawings are proprietary in nature and companies are not likely to share them. One can, however, find the odd set of drawings that is historical in nature. The Meccano project I did for my design talk number 11 was one such case where research turned up a whole set of Meccano drawings, most of which were irrelevant to today's product. Be sure to check out my Meccano design talk number 11 for an in-depth look at that. Another option when it comes to looking for CAD practice is to download 3D models from places like GrabCAD. 
One can find many excellent models there, and if one even has the software from which they were created, one may even be able to do build reviews to see how they were made, let alone just grabbing dimensions and other info. When I used this hub motor as a learning aid, I downloaded it as a STP file and opened it in SOLIDWORKS where I snagged dimensions while modeling it on my second screen in TurboCAD. As I mentioned, one can often download models in their native format, like many of those from McMaster Car, and then you can perform a model review via the part reviewer palette in SOLIDWORKS or simply by working through the design tree. Check out a number of my other design talks, like Notchbox, where model build reviews are an integral part of the presentation. The build review is an excellent way to see how I went about modeling the topic model, and maybe you can learn from that as well. Occasionally one will come across CAD blogs or CAD forum posts where folks have shared their drawing discoveries. One such discovery I came across in a CAD forum was a link to a whole series of 2D drawings by Timoteo Carreras Soto. Although a non-English series, users can use many of them for CAD practice reference. Some are easier than others, and the odd one you attempt may throw you for a loop as you find missing or incorrect dimensions. That, however, can be taken as part of the learning experience, since to err is to be human, as that saying goes. Both examples pictured here were modeled by me based on Timoteo's drawings. In one case, I included the old drawing as part of the rendered output, and in the other, I remade the drawing as well as the model and included both in the final output. Another good way to learn and practice one's CAD skills is to purchase or borrow technical drawing books that have examples within the pages. One such book I purchased was an earlier edition of the one pictured here. It has many model-based dimensioned examples to try. These can be a bit visually overwhelming, but if one works through the model in a logical manner, success can be achieved and the dimensioning will make sense. Some examples will force you to research different types of tolerances. I noted that many of those in this book were what were called limit tolerances, that is an allowable range. In a similar fashion, I modeled this tool post from the same book, only this time I remade the drawings as well, doing my best to mimic the model-based dimensions. It was a bit challenging since I did it in TurboCAD, and it is not really intended for model-based dimensions. My version of SOLIDWORKS has some model-based dimension tools, but they are quite primitive there as well. Maybe that's changed in later versions. Company brochures are often a great place to find ortho views of their products with dimensions too. I modeled this bobcat using the brochure illustrations for reference. It worked really well in this case. Here is one more done in a similar fashion. I modeled this cooler based on illustrations found in a zero zone brochure like the one pictured here. In my days of glass door manufacturing, I would often model customer cases and put our doors on them for presentation. This last little bit reminds me of the first TurboCAD tip I produced about scaling a drawing to determine other sizes. If one knows the dimensions of a standardized part, one can generally scale the whole drawing based on that little info. This tip was about scaling a floor plan, but I use this method a lot to help me scale reference images that I insert to my CAD files as trace aids. Google image searches for mechanical drawings or other such things can produce results. Many folks who came before us have also been practicing CAD and posting the results to share their successes. There's nothing wrong with reviewing their works and trying to mimic what you see. Pictured here is a motorcycle front fork bracket that has been popular to try and model. One can see examples of it in many social media forums like Pinterest. I chose to model the bracket in TurboCAD and I have recreated the drawing to boot. Here we can see both in my Keyshot render. YouTube is often a good place to look for things to model, although you'll likely need a pen and a paper handy to jot down dimensions if they get mentioned. One fellow I followed for a long time was Mr. Pete222. He has many older videos where he does machining projects and one could snag some dimensions as he's presenting. He also has a lot of followers, and some of these followers make drawings based on what he says and make them available to viewers. Just recently, someone offered to host these drawings, and they can be found at the link shown here. 
I made several models based on Mr. Pete's videos. Pictured here is a machinist jack render I am particularly fond of. I even 3D printed the model just for fun. I had made drawings too and gave them to my son-in-law with the hope of him making me one. He's a machinist and would likely be able to pop one of these off in no time. Some videos, although very interesting and inspirational like this wooden jack restoration video, offer no dimensions at all. If one wants to model it for the sake of practice, one has to do their best to figure it all out. I like to do this on occasion, so I do my best to research and work out all the details. Sometimes one can see the presenter use a wrench or other such tool and note the wrench size. Sometimes, like with this jack, I worked it all out based on standard sized gears, at least as a starting point. I then used logic to work out the rest of it. Be sure to check out my design talk number 7 for a closer look at this project. In a similar vein, I modeled this vintage lamp that I saw in a restoration video. It had some great parts that took some doing to get modeled, specifically the light socket and light bulb end. Both are based on standardized parts, so finding reference material for them helped with overall sizing. On another note, I know that lots of new CAD users want to find reference material and tutorials that spell everything out, but I think that using things like these restoration videos makes a CAD user really focus on the larger picture. It's true that not all new users could model something like this lamp based solely on visuals, so it's important to find things that are more manageable to start with, but also more challenging as one progresses. When one starts to get a real good feel for their CAD software, they can widen their circle of training resources to include tutorials from other programs. I have years of experience with TurboCAD and SolidWorks, and just recently I've been looking at Inventor tutorials for inspiration and some resources to keep enhancing my CAD skills. I came across the YouTube channel of this fellow named Constantin one day while looking for CAD drawings to try modeling. I noted that some seemed quite challenging and I wondered if I could manage them in SolidWorks and TurboCAD. Pictured here is what he called a strong lever. I was able to model it in both programs with a bit more ingenuity required in TurboCAD. That was due to the different modeling methodology required. Once a user gets to know their CAD program and feels they can take on new projects, I think the next best way to practice is to design something. In this way one can put to use everything they've learned and can find areas that require further development. I've had the privilege of designing new products for real-world production, and I've designed a number of things for personal use. In both cases, I have found that doing so was a great creative high, something that's always been the driving force in my life. My motto is, a creative heart is a happy heart. One last piece of advice before we move into the CAD portion of this presentation. Remember that all learning takes time and effort. The more time you take to practice, the easier it'll get and the better you'll become. Keep in mind one of the things my wife used to tell her students and that I picked up and use as my own. That is, enjoy the process. Don't just look forward to the end result. The process is and can be most enjoyable if you allow yourself time and the opportunity to learn. As a side note, do you remember when I said one might run into drawing examples that proved to have issues? Well, the pipe wrench by Timoteo Carrera Soto was one such drawing. In the end, I just had to adopt to my own thinking and make sense of it and make tweaks to accommodate them. My results are pictured here. So let's look at a recent project I did for fun. We'll look at the motivation and the steps and procedures I did to bring it to fruition. Perhaps what I show here will give you some things to think about while pondering what I call CAD practice. That is the continuing of one's CAD education, as it were. I'm a follower of Instagram. I typically follow just a few people, but occasionally I'll spend a few minutes exploring here and there. I came across the heat exchanger image on the left during one of those explorations. I had no idea what it was, but I thought it looked really cute. 
I checked out the producer, Focus Creative Studios, and saw that they had many HO scale 3D printed products for sale. I looked closer at their Instagram page and their website and discovered the picture on the right. I saw that it was a model heat exchanger and saw that it was based on a real world product by Rocor. I did go to the Rocor website and saw a few similar things and got a general idea of what it was. Because my interest was already peaked and the website didn't have as many pictures as I would have liked, I began an intensive Google search. I came across numerous images that started to show what the inside looked like, and I latched on to the name Shallon Tube Oil Cooler or Heat Exchanger. I started to see several designs, and I wanted to gain a better understanding of how they worked. Armed with even more info now, I narrowed my search to more specific results, including some brand model numbers that I could find results for. As I searched and discovered even more info, I came to the point where I could understand the flow of one style more than the other. The unit on the left is very much like the Rocor unit that the original 3D printed unit is based on. It seems like a cooling fluid travels through half the lines to the opposite side, and then via pressure from the inward direction, it finds its way back through the lower half of the cooling lines. Having come across the image on the right and others like it, I began to like the U-shaped lines better. They made more sense to me, and so I decided I would focus on this style. Continuing my search for info, I eventually came across this animation on an educational website. Although a slightly different setup than the original 3D printed design, it confirmed what I was learning about the flow of the oil, the coolant, and the design of the baffles. It's all very ingenious, and it made me appreciate the engineer who must have designed it. By this point, I knew what I wanted to model, but I had no idea what the size might be. I had seen via Google units of varying sizes, so I needed to narrow that down. I stumbled across a Rocor brochure on a different website, and this proved to be very beneficial. Within the brochure, I found a table of sizes for some different styles and models, so I narrowed my search to one specific size for which I would base my 3D model on. In the end, I decided on the 3-1192A model. I used most of the dimensions while modeling, but made a few small tweaks to make it my own, so to speak. At this point, we'll go and have a look at the shell and tube oil cooler in TurboCAD and discuss the build process in a bit more detail. So here we are in TurboCAD. I've got this rendered in visualize mode, shades of gray. I'll just show you what that looks like. So here's the settings that I'm using. New to TurboCAD 2022 were a few of these extra units like X-ray, conceptual, and shades of gray. And then they added some extended parameters down here. So be sure to check that out. It's kind of neat. I'm still a little bit disappointed because a lot of the tools or some of the tools don't work while working in visualize mode. So one has to go back to wireframe in order to use them. I'm hoping they'll fix that at some point in the future. In the near future would be great. So I'll just do a quick orbit so you can see that this is indeed 3D and all of the parts are made within. So we'll just do a real quick review to show how I went about modeling this. So I'm going to turn all of these layers off for now and we'll go through them one at a time. Let's go ahead and start with the main cylinder 2D. So I just laid out a couple of 2D objects to define the overall size I was shooting for. And then as I started to work, I made some revolve profiles and some additional profiles for the different things that were needed. So again, I took those dimensions from that Rocor brochure. I did make some tweaks, as I said, so that's not 100% accurate in that regard. So as you can see, I modeled off of that. Main revolve and some extrusions, things like that. For these threads, I downloaded a model from McMaster Car and used it as a subtraction aid to create the threads that were required in there. 
So we'll turn these two off and we'll go to the end cap. So I worked on this end cap over here. We'll just turn that on. It started out as shallow. Do you remember in one of those images we showed? It had a shallow unit, um, but I decided to use the U-shaped pipes instead. So I just adapted this to do that. These holes were to extrude and subtract to create the clearance hole in here. Next was the, the other side, the end cap there. So I laid out some profiles as needed. I'll turn that on. Here you can see this profile down here gave us this shape here. We added this in here and then we cut this all out afterward to give us this dome shape in here. Next was the gasket. It was a simple revolve, so let's just turn on this end cap to see where that is. So it's just revolved around there. And then I added these units up here. Or maybe I traced this in here and just extruded the profile. I could have changed it because I did make a few different changes in here while I worked. Next is the U-bolt. So that's what that looked like to start. And then I swept that along there. Then I went ahead and used the thread 3D tool to create some threaded objects, which I added to this unit. We have washers and bolts on here. Those I downloaded from McMaster Car. So this was the bracket 2D. So that's the side profile and the slots, things like that. As I worked on this, I tweaked this to have more of a seat, as you can see here. That's how I came about with that, and then of course using fillets to create the rounded portions. Next we have some screws for the end caps. Those were also downloaded from McMaster Car, along with washers for there. Of course, we would have added these maybe in a little bit different order because washers would have come before the nuts or before the bolts. Next, I worked on the baffles and the end plates for those cooling lines. So I made two different units, one for the ends and one for the center baffles. And then I added those in there equidistant, just like so, and rotated as needed. For the coolant lines, I just used polylines with a filleted end. A lot of these could be duplicates, as you can see, like these ones along here. They're just duplicates, so I just created one and then I moved copies into place. And then next I swept the profile for those. Let's turn off these last two units here. Here's the profile for the cooling line. And then I just rail swept those along there, just like so. And because that was a solid circle, I shelled each of these units, just like so. Next I made a profile. Can't really see it here, so let's turn these things off. And I made a copy of the main cylinder so that I could create this cutaway for the drawing that I was making later on. Then I created some text that I wanted. And then I trimmed it down by subtracting a, an extrusion or circular extrusion that I made up top here. Once that was all done, I went ahead and made a copy of everything. And I created this exploded view that I used in a drawing as well further along. So that's my take on CAD practice in a nutshell. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it'll give you some things to think about while looking for things to model. If you haven't already done so, be sure to check out my other design talks. Perhaps you'll find something else of interest in them. See you next time.